up here. You can do that by going to the website. It's an online little tool called at repel.it, WAC languages, WAC Python. And um, <clears throat> actually, there was a, another attendee who was like entering in like the three chevrons. Don't do that. Just type in what you see um, up there. And you can follow along doing that. So, okay, so just a real quick recap of what we did earlier in the workshops today. In the first <coughs> workshop, we learned about numbers, variables, strings, booleans, and making choices with the use of if statements. And in the second workshop, we added lists and looping to our skills. And along the way, we used actually a few functions, um, such as the built-in functions print and length. And actually, we used a couple of others, remove and uh, uh, string. But in this workshop, we're going to go a little further in depth into functions and Python modules. So like I said, functions. Um, we have, in, in the earlier workshops, we saw a few functions. Length for calculating lists and string lengths, and sum for summing up lists. Uh, so functions, what are functions? We can use functions for a number of things. We can use functions to break down a problem into parts. It makes the code more readable and it's easier to understand. Um, functions can also be used instead of using the same lines of code at different times throughout a program. We call this code reuse, and what it does is simply reduce the duplication of code. Um, functions also um, allows us to hide all of the details involved and put them into one place and simply call the function to execute the lines of code. So Python allows us to uh, create our own functions. So we're going to start off with, a, with an example. So we have a program that will wish someone a happy birthday. And in this line of code, we have print happy birthday, dear Carol. It's just one line of code. And we can make this line of code into a function. So let's see. Uh, so what we have here is, we'll call it uh, and happy birthday, and then we'll have that line of code up there, print happy birthday, and we'll place it into the function. So basically, the top part of the function, def happy birthday carol parentheses colon, it's called the header of the function. The header um, contains the keyword def, and def is the name of the function. Oh, excuse me, sorry. The header contains the word def, the name of the function, the parameter, and or, or parentheses, and a colon, in this case. Um, the, the keyword def is short for define, and it's how we let Python know that we are creating, that is defining our new function. In this function, the name of our function is, again, happy birthday, Carol. The body of our function contains our one line of, of, of code and it's indented um, in the body by four spaces. So if we decided to add another line of code, print happy birthday, dear we say, we would have to indent um, four spaces so that it's included in the body. Okay, so if we hit enter, um, we notice that nothing's printed out after we defined our function. To call our function, we basically <coughs> call like this, we write out the name of the function and um, with parentheses, we have to include that. And then we hit enter. And it will print out that line, happy birthday, dear, dear Carol. So we cannot forget the parentheses when we make our, um, our call to the function, because if we do, Python will not know that we're trying to call our function. It will give us this little statement here, function happy birthday at this note. Are those little parentheses ever used to put something inside there to do something else? Correct. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. You can actually pass in parameters. Okay. And uh, and we will get to that. <laughs> we, we planted him in the audience task. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> These are the big yard plants. Well, that's right. <laughs> but basically, I mean, you can you can create a slew of different functions with different names: Happy Birthday Carol or Happy Birthday Rise. Um, and that's that way you can reuse your code that you reduce code duplication. So, so now, getting back to, um, to what you just mentioned. 
um, it would be really cool if we could pass in some information into the function. So what we're going to do is uh, Python allows us to do just that with, with function parameters. We can add a parameter by typing a variable name in between the parentheses after our function name. And we can use the print, uh, parameter variable in our function. So we'll create a new function called happy birthday and add a parameter name. And then what we'll have from the line of code is print happy birthday dear plus, well, oh, and end code plus the parameter <coughs> or, and variable plus and then um, another string. And then to execute or run our function, we simply call it by its name, happy birthday. And in this case, we're going to pass it a value um, in between the parentheses, such as the string tray. So we're calling it, we're executing it, we're passing in the value tray, and voila, you get uh, a printout of happy birthday here and the name <coughs> with uh, the name variable is assigned tray, the string tray. Okay. So now we're going to work with this. So basically, um, we have names. Okay. We have a list called names, and it contains four four items in the list: Carol, well, four items that are strings: Carol, Reese, Trey, Emma. If we want to add Kendall, that's fine by me. And we can actually um, use a for loop that we learned in uh, actually last, last the last workshop or even the workshop before that. So that we can say for name and names, and we can call our function happy birthday up there, and pass in name into the function, and hit return, and it will basically print out um, those lines with um, each of the items in the list names, um, each of the strings, Carol, Reese, Trey, Anna, and Kenzie Kendall. And uh, so now, am I going too fast? Does anyone have a question? No, I do have a question for them. Um, sure. Because what if you had a list of, say, 200 names, yeah. and it's on a website? Yeah. Could you put it in a file and reference the file? Or does an array have to really you know, be with the brackets in those? Do you know what I mean? Like, you can call in a file with the names instead of... Oh, okay. Well, what you would do is, you would, like, so with the Python file, like, well, let's we'll see here. Would you open the file, parse it out, and then run it? Well, you... You couldn't really do it. Okay, I guess my question, like, say I have a website with 50 cities that you can choose from. Yeah. Do I have to list all 50 cities? Or could I put a file name... Could you ask that actually right after we're done? Because okay. we can we can show that, but it's probably going to take about you know, four or five minutes to like. Sure, sure. Finish. No, I just. But yeah, we, we could probably do that as a demo right after. Good so. question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll get that too. Okay. <laughs> I was planning. <fine> okay. By the PHP group. Okay. So now we're gonna. Okay. So we just demonstrated a for loop. Um, we passed in a list of strings. <clears throat> and uh, pass uh, each of those items in the list into the, um, into the function happy birthday. So now what we're going to do is, let's see here, so now we're going to create a function that will return a value uh, to where the function was initially called. So we will create a new function called get cupcake count. This is in honor of my, my daughter, my six-year-old daughter, Mayari. Loves cupcakes. And what we're going to do with this function is we're, we're going to multiply the number of guests by two and return the result because each guest wants to eat two cupcakes. That's what little kids do. So in our function def get cupcake counts, we pass in, pass in a parameter um, named guest and then we're returning um, this, this, the result, which is um, multiply two times the. Um, variable, the parameter of death. <clears throat> so, if we, oh wait, do we define guess? No, if we define guess, 
Yeah. Oh no no, we're gonna make a call. Sorry sorry sorry. So so the next line basically we're gonna we're gonna call the function get cupcakes. So we're gonna we're gonna say print and we're gonna create a string we need to make and then plus and then we're we're gonna call another function string and then we're gonna call the function get cupcakes and and actually pass that into the function string. <coughs> But even before that, get cupcakes, we're going to pass in this integer 10 into the function get cupcakes, get, get, get cupcake count. <coughs> Sorry. So close parentheses, close parentheses, plus, and then just add in plus, you know, space cupcakes. Is it freaking out? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Terminal, so. It's okay. So, so basically what I'm saying is, in that statement, print, we need to blah, plus string, get cupcakes, that's, that's the call. We're calling the definition there. And what it does, it takes in the 10, the integer 10, and it passes it into, it calls get cupcakes count, it passes in that integer 10 into the, into the parameter guess, and then in the body of the function, return two times guess, it will, it will assign guess the integer 10. And so two times 10 is 20, so it returns that value to where get cupcake count is. So 10 is there. So that's the input to string, right? And the reason why we're, you're giggling. The reason why you're, because <laughs> it's breaking, right? So the reason why um, we, we, we actually, um, put the return value into string, str, and the function string is because you cannot concatenate an integer with strings. And of course, we learned that actually in workshop one, where we got this error, you cannot concatenate uh, strings with integers. So what I'm doing here is basically I'm casting. I'm casting that integer 10 into a string. So it becomes string 10, so quote unquote, quote unquote 10. So that you can concatenate. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. So yeah, so right here, so we need 20 cupcakes. And we were able to do that. But like I said, if we got rid of that, the STR, then Python would just get all upset at us. Okay. So that's good. Okay, so we're going to talk about one last thing, and that just to let you know that Python, well, functions you can pass more than one parameter, uh, and so we're going to demo just a function that passes in two parameters. So we're going to slightly change our cupcake example, or get cupcake count. We're going to pass in. So what we'll do is instead of saying get get cupcake count guess pass in the parameter guess we're gonna we're gonna pass in two params cupcakes comma guess and then um, we're going to call that function sorry sorry am I am I talking too fast no okay no so then now we're gonna call that function get cupcake count and we're gonna pass in two integers four and fifteen so four will be assigned to cupcakes. 15 will be assigned to yes. And then it'll pass that into those variables there on, on that line, return cupcakes times guess. And it, pass, it basically returns um, the integer 60. Okay. And that's pretty much all I have on functions. I mean, I could talk a lot more about it. <laughs> Um, and so now, well, first of all, this, okay, so getting back to your question, if you have a list of like a gazillion items, right? Okay, so the way I would do it, now you correct me, you guys have different approaches than I do, but I, so what I would do is I'd create like a, a Python file, you know, like, you know, uh, get count for list or something dot py, or whatever, call it something, file dot py, and in that I would have a, a method. Yeah. 
actually, can you just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would say something like, get, get the number of items. I would declare a function, def, get, get the number of items in the list. And then what I would do is, let's see here. Then I would, and then I'd write it out so that I would pass in the list. So I don't know, names equals 1,000 items in the list, right? And then I would, <laughs> is everyone following me? Okay, and then I would, um, and then I would, what I would do is I'd um, pass that parameter, names, into the function's body, and I, I assign it, and so I do like a for name in names. So the names would be passed into names, right? And the parameter names would be passed in and assign it to names inside the, the body of the function. And then I would run a for loop on it. And then I'd, do a, I'd have a, some sort of counter or something. And then, um, then that way, and then I return it, return like some you know, running total of, of the, um, the number of items in the list. Is that what you're asking? Or is it something well, slightly different? I don't really care how many there are. I just kind of wanted, what if you wanted to either display them in a drop down menu? Oh. Or, <clears throat> say, I mean, or say you said some sensitive data you didn't want hanging out on your website, but you did want to parse it. Or, uh, I would stick it in the database. Stick on the database and then have a function call it and then bring it back. Yeah. If you need to just take it in a file, and I can show you real quick, I just found a list of states. Um, and this is not something I don't expect you to follow along and actually type this. Um, oh, so you actually <coughs> put the states in a text file? Yeah. Um, and I'm just showing that this is something you can do in Python using the functions. Uh, states. Oh, you know, I think you, well, you reminded me how, I, I know how I would do it, like, I guess I don't know how to do it in Python, I know how I would do it in Perl, in, in Perl. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, the only thing I know. Oops. So, we open the file, or a database. we look through each, each line of the file. Or open your database and you move through all the rows. It's a very similar concepts regardless of whether it's a file okay. or a database. So once you learn about lists in Python, um, you can use very similar rules for sets, for dictionaries, for databases, for files, uh, some kind of it's, it's just iterating over whatever you know, kind of things that you've got. In this case it's lines in the file. I, I realize that code is a little bit cryptic there. Okay, so that says what? With open and then that's your file name as F and then yeah, F is a file descriptor there. I think okay. it may be a little bit more clear if we do the F dot read lines. That's the thing. Does, uh, does Python work with pretty much any database type out there? Yeah, that's so um, you need a, ba a, a back end to actually talk to the database type, but yeah, there's one for everything. Okay. So if you had like a SQL database, how would I don't know like what you guys have planned for today, but how would you connect to an SQL database using Python? Uh, you get the, I don't remember what the MS SQL adapter is called. The MySQL one is called Python-MySQL. Um, I assume the MS SQL one is named something similar. Um, I actually think I have a file on my computer that has it in here. There's, it's built into SQLite support. There's definitely MySQL support. There's Postgres support. Um, I know there's Microsoft SQL support because I so I'm uh, I'm gonna do the modules section. Um, yeah. yeah, you can you know, type. Yeah. Um, so we're not gonna show you how to make your own module. Uh, but we will show you how to use some modules. So the, the Python standard library comes with a lot of built-in modules. Uh, for example, there's a random module um, that you can use for generating randomness. Uh, maybe not pure randomness, but good enough 
for <laughs> most cases. Uh, you're on a Linux So to, to use a module, you have to import. So we're going to type import random. Wait, wait, wait. All right. Let me get back. I need to move it. Okay. Right there. Four. No, 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 no. The first one, the second one, that's good. I know, but I want to get back here because I have to move it down. I can't. I, I need to go. Oh, the mouse. The mouse. Um, it's, it's Sorry, to guys. the left. I realize the monitor is above it, but it's stuck it to the right. Cause it, Oh, is that what? Oh, yeah, okay, okay. I, I see. I get it. Okay, gotcha. Sorry about that. Um, so we're going to import the random module. Uh, so random has the random module has lots of functions in it. Um, one of the functions is rand int. Uh, so after we've imported the random module, we're uh, going to use that. So rand int it will generate a random integer. Uh, between two parameters that you give it. So uh, if we called random.randin1, uh, six, that would uh, basically be the same as a, a dice roll. We would get a number between one and six inclusive. Um, so in this case, we got one. If we did it again, we did it, you know, another number possibly, but it's random, who knows. Um, so let's use the random integer drill. Uh, integer function to simulate rolling um, dice in a game. Um, so one and six included. One and six are included. Yes, inclusive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unlike um, the ends yeah. yeah. um, and both are required. I looked that up before we did this. I thought maybe one was optional. Hey, Trey, could we make the plot larger, or is it? The fonts are uh, control shift plus plus. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. 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 So we'll have two two cool. randomly Thanks. rolled dice, um, and then we'll, we'll print out what the first die was and what the second die was, and then we're going to sum the two and see what the total roll was. Because many many games that involve dice, we sum up the two dice and see what the, uh, the amount is. Uh, we can also put this in a function. Um, like we did earlier, but we're not going to do that right now. So our first one was two. We don't know what the second one is yet, but we, we have already uh, called it. <coughs> so the um, random module contains a lot of functions besides random int. Um, there's a random not random, which generates a random floating point number, which is not very really useful for all the stuff that I do. I like integers a lot more usually. Usually I'm generating numbers in a range. Uh, oh, it looks like the required dice were two. Uh, so we have four. So uh, there's also random dot choice. Um, and in this case, we'll type in random dot choice. Then we'll just give it a string of um, letters. So random.choice, you can give it a string, you can give it a list, anything you can iterate over. Um, strings are listed as two things we've gone over so far that you can loop over, and it'll randomly choose one of the things that we gave it. So in this case, it's the letter K. If we ran it again, if we ran it enough times, we'd probably know what it's the output. Um, so we could use random.choice, for example, to wish a random friend happy birthday. Uh, earlier we made a <laughs> names list. Um, I can't remember what was in the names list. Do we still have a names list? Yeah. We'll find out. Um, Mr. What? Mr. Y and happy birthday. That's okay. Sorry. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 just, we'll just call it a little differently. So, um, when, when making this function, what we're going to do is we're going to pass in um, a names list to our random happy birthday function, uh, and then we're going to randomly choose a name from that list, and then call the happy birthday function we defined before on that name. 
So this should print out uh, happy birthday, dear, and then one of the names that we passed into it. And it will use a new random name uh, every time we pass it in. Oops. I think we might already have a name uh, list. Do we? Yeah, you want to print it out and see if it names is actually defined. Oh, no, it's not. Can you see this at the bottom here? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Is it right here? No, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, let, let's make a... Um, Names list? Yeah, you can just type it straight out if you'd like. It, it might scroll up the screen. We'll see. Okay. So I must have left the Python interpreter. I think when everything started going wrong, I left it. So um, it looks like we might have to redefine our happy birthday function. So, so is it guess? Um, yeah, it was name. Happy birthday name, and then we printed... Um, really? Happy, yeah. It really doesn't matter what the parameter is called, but let's call it name. Oh, um, And then we printed happy birthday, dear, name. So, notice that um, we didn't mean to do this, but in this case we defined a function uh, after another function used it, and that's okay because we didn't. As long as we don't try to use the happy birthday name. Oh, I know why. Here. Oh, happy birthday name. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, guys. We hit that there a lot of times. <coughs> so another thing, I don't know if we went over this earlier. If you're using the Python. Um, up arrow, because it allows you to go back to the last command you typed in that. The way I was clearing the screen before, that was in control L. Uh, there you go, now let's do it again. Let's see if it... Oh, it's Alan every time. Did we do this right? Yeah. Like three. Yeah, do it again. Well, so far it's only wish talent that we go to. Yeah, but did we do that? Oh, there we go. We <laughs> <laughs> just got lucky. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The chances, yeah. it just like yeah. um, So the <laughs> random number generator, uh, well, built into Python, uses the random number generator on your computer, which is not very random. Uh, <laughs> not that you'll get the same number over and over, but it might be predictable. We <laughs> might get lucky. Uh, it's not my birthday. <laughs> Okay, well, um, let's see. Uh, that's pretty much all I've got. So, uh, we we're just going to. Well, I could show off um, making your own module, um, which was the, uh, another way to answer the question that you asked earlier. If you made your own module and stuck some things in it, um, basically, the way you do that is you make a .py file. A lot of the, the tutorials you go into, you know, so you don't need to have the modules. Um, oh, we did pretty early. Yeah, we, we did. We go into more modules. There's a, a date time module for getting the current date, current time. There's a... Um, out of the box, the date time module <laughs> supports like advanced functionality, like time zones and versions? No. So uh, there is a, a library to support time zones, so that's a good, uh, good question. Um, the gems that the Ruby guys mentioned in the last talk, uh, Python has something similar. Um, there's the Python package index, and there's a lot of Python libraries. So the Python open source community is really large. I've packed on a lot of open source Python packages, and uh, I put them all in the Python package index, so you can install them using um, 
you have um, package managers. Use install as one, and pip as another. Um, and you would type pip install, and then pytz, I think is the Python time zone package. And that allows you to augment the built-in daytime support. And the reason it's not built in the standard library is literally multiple times a year, multiple time zones change yeah. on a national basis. Uh, Russia decided to change there a while back. It's a big deal. Uh, smaller countries decide that sometimes they're going to flip their time zone by a half an hour or six minutes in some cases. Um, <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, not, the time zones are not all off by an hour. Um, and so that updates regularly. So you want to stay up to date with that if you actually have a large international interest. You mentioned the um, dependency manager, Pip? Or yeah, the uh, package manager. Package, package manager. manager. Yep. Can you, does it install at a global like system level? Yep. Or? Uh, by default it installs at a global level. Uh, you can also use um, uh, virtual environments, which allow you to uh, install all your packages in a little bundle inside one directory. Uh, and uh, you can even tell it, you know, isolate yourself, don't use the system packages, and that's good for making sure that your, your application, all the requirements that you've got listed are actually accurate. It's also good if you don't have read access on the machine you're on, you're not a system administrator. Like, for example, you're on a university machine, you can't change the stuff on the machine. Yeah. Um, you can do that on your home directory. And on documents. Do you guys, does it use, uh, like, uh, Semver, uh, semantic versioning? Or how does it track versions? Uh, rather? Um, right, so you can. You can give it um, in your requirements files, which is what you often give to your package manager. You can tell it, I want this version. It, it's good to pin your versions to say, I want to use version 2.3.6. But for example, for um, time zones, you might want to tell it, uh, I always want the latest version. And for, you can also tell it, for example, for um, Django, which is a web framework, you want the latest security release. So instead of saying, I want to use 1.6.0, I want to use anything greater than or equal to 1.6 and less than 1.7. And then in that range, it'll install the latest that's 1.6. So cool. it doesn't use the same semantic version as uh, maybe Node does, but it is semantic version. Cool. Sorry, I feel like I just uh, moved in my head. I don't want to run a topic, or maybe you talk about it. It's been a while since I've looked in on the status of it, but. What's the status with uh, uh, PHP 2 and PHP? I mean, Python 2 and Python 3. Python 3. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Python 3, um, it, a year ago I would have had a different answer, but it's, it's uh, very quickly becoming the Python choice. Uh -huh. uh, I, so in these examples, we've been using Python 2. That print statement in Python 3 is the big difference. Yeah. That's the only thing that I think is different in our presentation here. Can you check the version I'm using? Uh, two point something, two point seven. I'm not sure exactly what version, but well, Python, Python two. You're always on pretty much two point seven point something, and the, the point something doesn't really matter. I never noticed a difference. Um, I think you should either be on Python two point seven or the latest Python three, which is three point four, I think. Um, and Python three, it's adding new features, and it's uh, not entirely backwards compatible, mm -hmm. but I'll. The open, so the big thing that's holding a lot of people up is uh, if you're using open source libraries that do not yet support both Python 2 and Python 3, or have a Python 3 equivalent, you can't yet upgrade. But that's um, almost all the big libraries have Python 3 versions. So somebody starting with coding with Python right now, what would you suggest to? It depends on what they're doing. So if you're doing uh, scientific computing, um, I think uh, NumPy. They're either in the works or they already upgraded to Python 3, but it was very recently if, it, if that's the case. Um, so I'm, I might be in Python 2 for that. For web development, uh, if you're doing Django, Django supported Python 3 for a while. A lot of the Django ecosystem, the packages that are out there for extended, um, some of them don't yet support Python 3. All the big ones pretty much do. There's very few that don't. And any that don't that I'm using, I and often we'll jump on and help them add support for Python 3 because it's often not very hard once you've done it a couple times. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing that they do with the Python sprints that we were doing this year. Um, I was happy what I did there is we were adding Python 3 support to those niche packages that didn't yet have it. So I would recommend Python 3 for many cases, but I still show Python 2 because 
there's the occasional time you might run into something Python 2 and you might have to realize that uh, it doesn't yet support Python 3 and you need to either bother the author or see if maybe the latest version does. Mm -hmm. So, in a couple of years' time, we'll be in Python 3. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. Anything else? Are there uh, modules we should show up? Oh, there's a math module. That's kind of important. Yeah. That's where you can do square roots and other kind of stuff. Um, I guess as far as the ecosystem goes, uh, there's NumPy and SciPy for scientific computing. There's, uh, and those are very fast because they're in um, C and Fortran is what they're written in. So you can write Python libraries in other languages, uh, but you don't, as a user, you don't care what NumPy and SciPy are, are written in. You're just using your, your code. Uh, you're calling your functions, you're importing them in the what would be the um, argument for using Python over uh, Ruby? Right, so uh, if you're not doing web development, um, uh -huh. Ruby, Ruby's claim to fame is Rails for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I don't think many people would argue with that. Uh, Ruby is great for web development, and it's certainly good at many things besides web development because it's a, it's a nice language, but uh, Python has been popular in the scientific computing, system administration, security, and, and a couple other spaces for quite a while. Okay. So, so that's that's a big reason, uh, a big win for Python there is that it's, it's popular. Scientific computing, what, what were the other two? Um, pen testing uh, for security. Uh, so okay. if you go to DEF CON, for example, which is a security conference, a lot of people are using Python okay. uh, for system administration, okay. um, DevOps, WebOps. So if you're managing a large cluster of servers, especially Linux servers, you're probably using Python for a lot of your scripts. Um, the film industry. Thank you. The film industry is using Python. Yeah, really? So a lot of 3D animation studios, the visual uh, effects studios, uh -huh. they're using Python. And so video games. Intensive. They, they, have, yeah, so yeah. they have it in their pipeline. So Mathematical it's, computations, it's real good. Yeah, yeah oh, well, a lot of... Um, well, and it's because there's a lot of libraries written for it. Uh, I know 3D rendering, actually. I forgot about that. There's uh, multiple people in our local group that do 3D rendering in Python. I see. Um, there's also uh, hobbyist uh, Raspberry Pis. A lot of us have Raspberry Pis, and they come pre-installed with Python. Robotics. 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 Oh, yeah. Robotics. Anything that's yeah. really intense. You sold me. Needs. Yeah. Yeah. You pretty much PHP <laughs> job. <laughs> no, that's really cool. Seriously. Yeah. Well, we have a test room development with Django workshops that we do every few months or so. We do one in March. So we should do another one. We're, yeah, we're about on uh, track to do another one. Um, we also were doing some introduction to Python workshops, kind of like this. We haven't done one in a while, so maybe this will kickstart that. But our TDD Django tutorial or workshop is all open source and it's online. If you go to the pythonsd.org website, is that right? Pythonsd. Pythonsd.org. Yes. I think it's pythonsd.org. I just search for San Diego Python. <laughs> well, it's weird because we have our name is San Diego Python, but it's pythonsd.org. Oh, python right, this is why we get t shirts printed up. So yeah, we need t shirts. We will get t shirts. One's San Diego Python, one's pythonsd. That's just standardizing. Hey, their, their logo is pretty similar to ours. Look at that. No, your logo is so much worse. It's a logo. It's a surfboard. It's like a front end. It's a surfboard, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you guys to make a user interface. You it, it, yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. you need a, a visual. It's, it's if you're doing web, you're gonna use <laughs> Still. HTML, JavaScript, and visuals. And so that's uh, oh, it's this you point. use Django, which yes. actually looks very similar to Rails in the sense that the slides that we gave in the last talk. If you replace Rails with Django and all those slides, only a couple of them I might have uh, you know batted an eye. Um, yeah. But the the code does look different as far as. Uh, Desktop software, there's uh, at least a few libraries for doing um, GUIs. I think Alan knew what the one is. Yeah, uh, there's one called WX something. Uh, so there are some libraries that plug into this that allow it to. Yeah, have uh, that. GTK is. Um, WX Python, popular one. It's one of them. Thank you. So here's our workshop material, just for Django development. And if you need, if you have any questions about this while we'll walking through it, it's a build your own blog, so you can have your, your, your own website. Um, feel free to submit an issue or send us an email.
Uh, if you want to learn uh, Python and, and if you want to learn to build an uh, interactive graphic application in Python, there is an excellent course on Coursera okay. called uh, uh, Learning Interactive Programming with uh, Python. Okay. And to support that course, they actually developed and made available as open source software a module that gives you graphical tools. Oh, great. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, uh, write your processing modules and use that module they provide to give you the, uh, you know, menus, and the, the graphics to interact yeah. with your program. Yeah, cool. Um, we, we have actually a bunch of people going through that course right now on Saturday. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and uh, trying to remember the name of that so, module they made. A lot of people like IPython Notebook, which is uh, allows you to write Python in your web browser. This is a, this was our notes actually. Okay. This talk. This is how we were both making the same page. Um, we didn't just memorize it. Believe it or not. <laughs> You can do cool stuff. You can also make graphs. We've had uh, multiple talks at the uh, meetups about how to make cool graphs from your data sets and write down right in the web browser. Yeah, because that seems like the. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, this is actually the talk that we based a lot of this material on. Was, uh, if you want to watch this again at your own pace, it's uh, Jessica McKellar's um, hands-on introduction to Python. Mm -hmm. She gives that talk pretty much every year at the Python Jessica McKellar. Code Sculptor. It's not an introduction to interactive programming in yes. Python? Yes, that's yes. Okay. Yeah. Alright. That's the one I got. <laughs> it, it's great. You build video games, you shoot asteroids, you do. Uh... <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Sounds a lot of fun. Each workshop is a different game. Oh. <laughs> that's what I like to know. So Django is a, a big web framework that we, we purposely didn't touch on that at all today because we wanted this to be Python specific because mm -hmm. not everyone's making a website. What does Django use for? It's a web framework for... Is it like Rails for Python? Yeah, it's basically so Rails is to Ruby what Django is to Python. It's an opinionated web framework. It's okay. Uh, and uh, similar to Rails, it's... If you break from the mold, it can be a little bit painful, but for that 80% case, it's great. However, Django recently has become a lot more flexible, so uh, breaking from the mold is becoming easier and easier as the external framework and becoming more extensible and less rigid. Maybe we can show the PyLadies Meetup uh, site on the, um, so people can um, sign up if they like to. I'd like to mention another space where Python is, is pretty strong. We, we mentioned uh, uh, science in general, but uh, statistics, oh, statistics, yeah. okay. data science, and machine learning. Python uh, is really strong. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is actually an open source language R, which is dedicated to statistics. Uh -huh. But Python is a library called Pandas that offers pretty much the same now. What is the library called? Pandas. Pandas. P A N D A S. Oh, Pandas. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> cute. <laughs> yeah, at our Saturday study groups, there's a lot of us that are learning, and a lot of us that already know Python, uh, and even if you already know Python, um, I hope to learn some science of computing stuff and that analysis from those groups, because I do most of the web stuff, uh, like Pandas, for example. Um, 
And so we meet every Saturday at uh, Pantry Bakery. Number one, two, four, five, I don't know. Whenever, whenever the last person leaves. Uh, every Saturday. Every Saturday. Yeah. So feel free to join us. That's so we're seeing people, you know, 